Good morning. And are we set? Okay. Good morning and welcome to worship. We welcome those of you gathered here and those of you who are joining us from home. I think attendance is down a bit this morning because folks will be coming to the later service. Today's our church picnic. We also begin our fall worship series, Portraits of Christ, and today we consider Christ the Savior. We invite you, if you have a personal favorite portrait of Christ, to share it in the gathering space. If you're worshiping from home, we invite you to join us at any of our services at 8.15 on Sunday mornings, at 9.30 for this, our contemporary service, and at 10.45 for our traditional service. We thank you for continuing to so support our food ministry partners in Burton and Bainbridge. You can drop food off at the cart out in front of the building. Uh, our Kids Life program kicks off this morning with uh, in-person classes for our pre-K through grade five. Middle school is kicking off right now in adult programming also. We also continue to collect, uh, receive contributions for the folks who have been impacted by Hurricane Ida and the recent flooding. We partner with Lutheran Disaster Response in these efforts and already have a presence in all locations where disasters have taken place. You can designate Ida flooding or just disaster response if you want to give to one of these efforts. Communion, if you will be communing from home, uh, please remember to have your communion elements prepared and place them on your home altar. In our prayers today, we pray for all those who are hospitalized. We pray for health care workers and those uh, facing the surge in, in coronavirus cases. We pray for the hospitalized, uh, the elderly, and the vulnerable. And we invite you to share additional prayer concerns in the prayers of the people. We're grateful for your ongoing support in so many ways, and we invite you to join us each morning at 1130 on Facebook for a daily devotion. Let's begin worship this morning with a word of prayer. Holy, gracious, and, <clears throat> and loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your presence in our lives. We give you thanks for guiding us and directing us in following your will and your ways. And when the world falls apart or the bottom falls out of our world, we give you thanks for entering into the difficult moments, the troubling situation, the moments of despair or grief, and being present with us reassuring us and reminding us that we are never alone. We pray these and all things, Lord, in your most precious name. Amen. Let's stand and join Atrium as we begin worship this morning.
brought your Bibles with you. We are in the 8th chapter of Mark, beginning at the 27th verse. Jesus went, went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell him anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd and with his disciples and said to them, If anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed when he comes into his glory. This is the gospel according to Mark. Let's stand and join Atrium as we sing Days of Elijah. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, our Savior. We 
give you thanks that when we're celebrating major, major highs in our lives that you are there, just as we give you thanks that when the bottom falls out of our world, you are there too. Remind us, guide us, direct us, and keep us faithful in your will and your way, in your name. Amen. It was our, our first trip to the well-known eatery. Uh, we were celebrating a birthday. For me, childhood birthdays were chaotic events where uh, we were the center of attention uh, and family and friends were tripping over one another to find a place at the, at the dining table. Living so far from our families as we do, we wanted to make this birthday a special one. And so we found just the right place to celebrate Marissa's third birthday. Our favorite restaurant since arriving here was always reminding us once the kids arrived that they did not have high chairs. They're not so subtle way of saying we were not welcome when we brought the kids with us. And so instead, we went to Chuck E. Cheese. There would be no extra family present. But for those who have had the privilege of dining at this fine establish, you know, the establishment, you know that in addition to the cardboard-like pizza, there's an arcade and an animatronics life-size mouse who serenades you on your birthday, every three-year-old's dream. Our Corinne was in her infant seat, and Marissa loved the, the atmosphere where she won tickets and ran between the token-taking monstrosities. When we had our fill of celebrating, we headed home. And I still recall as a parent of young children when they would fall asleep on the way home the pleasure of fitting them into their pajamas, tucking them in, and then watching them slumber for a few moments, maybe offering a prayer. The next morning, I was thinking of our outing as I drove here to the church, and I still recall the drive. The sky could not have been any bluer. It was a perfect morning. All was right with the world. The safety of my family, the security of our homeland was the furthest thing from my mind. We had just moved into this sanctuary a couple of months before. It was such an exciting time for our congregation and for my young family. An hour or so later, as I prepared for a Bible study, someone came in and said that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And we scrambled to get the news and learned that by 9.30, all bridges and tunnels leading in and out of New York had been closed, and that America was apparently under attack. In the span of less than an hour, I had gone from the feeling that everything was right with the world, that nothing could possibly go wrong, to this enormous pall being pulled over our universe. In moments like that, our need for the Savior was so clear. It was as clear as ever. No one knew what to do. Not knowing what to do, we threw open the doors of our, of our church, invited the other churches to join us, and that evening, every seat in this place was filled. It was standing room only as we sang, O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. It is still hard to fathom that 9-11 happened 20 years ago yesterday. 18 months into this global pandemic, it is still hard for me to fathom the far-reaching tentacles of all that is happening. And in the years since 9-11, there have been countless moments around the globe where catastrophic change has visited the human population. In 2004, a tsunami hit Thailand. In 2006, Katrina. In 2008, the Great Recession. In the past several years, it seems like the West Coast has been on fire. In just the past few weeks, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes. Someone is sitting there saying, Pastor Rob, today's Welcome Back Sunday. Where are you taking us? <laughs> today we begin our, our Portraits of Christ series. And today we have the great exhortation of Peter in response to Jesus' question, Who do you say that I am? Boldly, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the chosen of God, the Savior of the world. When Peter says this, what is on his mind 
is the understanding that Jesus is going to save him and all of Jesus' followers from just the sort of chaos that I have just described to you. That Jesus will pluck us up out of the diagnosis or the grief or the despair or the delusions or whatever it is that you may be facing today. That's what Peter is thinking as he proclaims Jesus the Savior, the chosen of God. And so when Jesus begins to teach that he'll undergo suffering and be rejected and be killed, Peter takes him aside and tries to straighten him out, tries to point out to him, Lord, you got the whole idea of Messiah wrong. Messiahs don't suffer. Saviors don't die. They are large and in charge. Peter can't imagine a, a Savior who suffers and dies. It's quite possible that Peter didn't even hear what the Lord said of rising. But it is in that rising that most clearly sets Jesus apart. It's the resurrection where we meet the Savior. It was Paul who wrote, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Paul is writing after the resurrection. To him, the rising is, is clearly the most important. He continues, Those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ. We, of all people, are most to be pitied. Paul could not be clear. Without the resurrection, nothing else matters. And while Paul knows the resurrection as truth and as event and as reality, Peter, as yet in this gospel, does not know. The sign over the door was very, very clear. Could not have been any clearer. God's gym. God's gym. Well, at one time it said gold's gym, but the L has been burned out for so many years that now everyone calls it God's gym. I like it. What might a workout in God's gym look like? Perhaps it's a place where, like Peter, my notion of Savior might be challenged. Or a place where I might go to strengthen my trust in Jesus as Savior. If, if you went to God's gym what would you work on? Of all, the of all the, those who have walked the face of the earth, no one has commanded more attention than Jesus. Some thought he was mad. Some thought he was a novel teacher with new ideas. Some, like Peter, thought that he was a, a political leader who would liberate his people from the Romans. Others thought he was of the devil. In the past two millennia, there have been many differing portraits of Jesus. In the 50s, in the greatest story ever told, Jesus is pictured as a great healer. Godspell pictured him as a clown on the fringes of the world. Jesus Christ Superstar pictured him as a musical superstar. Today, we consider Christ as our Savior. For thousands of years, the Jews had waited on a Savior. Prophet after prophet after prophet promised one day he would come. Isaiah even went so far as to give us a job description. He'll bring good news to the oppressed, healing to the brokenhearted, comfort to the mourning. And it was about 2,000 years after Isaiah's prophecy that Jesus finally came on the scene. And Peter has been hit, one of his closest companions through seven and a half chapters of Mark. He has witnessed the miraculous meals, the healings, the crowds, the throngs of people. He's witnessed firsthand all that Jesus has said and done. He's seen how he's brought good news of God's love and grace to people who felt abandoned by God. He's watched as Jesus has opened the eyes of the blind, fed the hungry, proclaimed mercy to the mi those mired in guilt and shame. And he cannot imagine that he would suffer and die. And now for more than two millennia since the resurrection, he's brought hope to the discouraged. Billions have claimed his love and made a place for this Savior in their hearts. The Portland, the Portland vase is priceless. It's a two-handled Roman uh, amphora dating to a century or two before Christ. And after many changes in ownership over the years, it was housed in the British Museum. And then one day in 1845, a drunk hurrying carelessly through the museum smashed the priceless piece to bits. It appeared that the shards would have to be swept up and thrown away. But John Doubleday painstakingly pieced it back together. He was such a lover of the arts and of art itself. He did so in such a way that only by careful examination can you see 
that it had been broken. Jesus, the Savior, does the same thing for his followers. We all, every one of us, gets broken by life in small ways and significant ones. And the Savior, with love and grace, enters into our broken lives and puts the pieces back together. In moments of discouragement, he energizes us with hope. When we take the wrong fork in the road, he redirects us and points us on the right path. He's there to love us, to forgive us, and to show us the way. Timothy's father was driving him to kindergarten one morning. They were talking on the way. Timothy announced, Daddy, I think I'll be sad in school today. Sad? Why? You don't seem like you're having a sad morning. What are you talking about? I'm not really sad, Daddy, but I'm going to be sad in school because when you're sad, the teachers all take turns giving you hugs. We all long for a savior. We all long for those hugs. At the end of the year party for Jimmy's second grade class, families were invited to join for the picnic and the festivities. His mom brought his younger brother with her. His younger brother, Dane, learned very differently from the other children. He went to a different school. Too much stimulus made him nervous and feeling unsafe. He would begin to rock and then shriek. The festivities were going well until a rambunctious game of freeze tag moved and surrounded Dane. Dane was tagged, but he didn't freeze. The boy who froze him protested, Hey, I froze you. You have to freeze. You didn't freeze. You're frozen. Stop moving. Dane began to rock. And then the shrieks started. Jimmy's mother went to comfort Dane, and Jimmy's teacher came to his side. She said to him, Jimmy, this must be hard for you. And he looked up at her quizzically. No, he said, Mrs. Taylor, this is not hard for me. This must be hard for Dane. And with that, he ran to his brother and joined his mom in a protective shield around his younger brother. Jesus, the Savior, is like that older brother. When life becomes overwhelming... When life leads us through a time of sadness, our Savior stands ready to see us through. With grace and love, he, he accepts and receives the multitude of emotions that are often surging inside of us. You've heard the legend. The woman was traveling and became lost and fell into a bed of quicksand. And Confu Confucius came along and saw her dilemma and proclaimed, It is evident that people should stay out of places such as this. And he moved on. And Buddha came and observed, let this woman's plight be a lesson to us all. And he moved on. And Muhammad remarked, alas, it is the will of God. And he moved on. And lastly came Jesus. And he said, here, take my hand and I will save you. Peter is confused in this gospel because Jesus challenges his notion of Savior. Jesus is a Savior who joins us in the muck and the mire of life, who loves us unconditionally, who welcomes us to his table of mercy, who offers hope to the most hopeless among us, and who paves the way to the future. Peter may not yet understand, but we do. Amen.
am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Please join me in a time of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for entering into the difficult moments of our lives. We pray for all those, all those families who were touched by tragedy 20 years ago and all those families who are touched by tragedy today. We pray for health care workers, those on the front lines, and all those who suffer in any way, particularly with the coronavirus. We pray for leaders in our nation and around the world that they would be guided by you to follow your will and your way in all decisions. We pray for those on the front lines, for those first responders, for those who work to keep the world a safe place. We pray for those uh, in, our, in our families and those loved ones that are, that are going through a tough time right now. This morning we especially lift up Benny Bailey, Lily Berg, the Herb family, Dale Gabor, Marsha, Marvin Howard, Sue Hutching, Lauren Hutnick, Carol Koval, Teresa Ludwigson, Dana Lutz, Heidi, Mitch, Lindsay, Barb, Carolyn, Newmore, Nikki, Laura, Richie, Robin, Dorothy Smith, Jim Susnick, Audrey Beeth, Tom Bosmer. We pray for the family of Russell Wilson, for Alicia, Pat, Don, Carol, uh, Brandon, Judy, Ruth, Jim, Emily, Natalie, Laura, Bill, Mark, Tom, Aaron, and those who we name now aloud before you or in the quiet of our hearts. All these, Lord, and those things that we pray with sighs too deep for words, we pray them all in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We remember on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering, we pray as Jesus taught, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome to receive communion. Uh, we will serve it in a contact-free way if you, as you come forward, and you'll come forward on these angled aisles. If you just hold your hands out like this, we will place communion in your hands.
Rock of Ages. Mm -hmm. 